Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Brendan Leach is the CEO of Calibri Boutique Hotels, which have properties in Tulum, Mexico, and Nicaragua. Sean first stayed at one of their boutique hotels a few years ago and still talks about the food, the drinks, and the care that went into his stay, which is why he wanted to feature Brendan. This episode dives deep on Brendan's adventure-filled journey from New Zealand to Tulum and some of the crazy travel experiences in between. They discuss how to build a successful business and why learning about attention to detail at a young age has been instrumental in the success of Calibri. The Calibri company slogan, Because We Love It, or Porque Nos Encanta, gives you a sense of the culture they've built. So get ready to hear what it's like building a company on pillars such as integrity, respect, fairness, passion for service, and teamwork. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple, too, to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options, and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. Looking for your next getaway to a beach paradise? Ever consider Tulum, Mexico, which is one of my favorite places to spend a few days? Then look no further than Colibri Boutique Hotels to make your trip to paradise one you'll never forget. Head to ColibriBoutiqueHotels.com to see their hotels, all of which offer their own unique feel. Calibri not only has built amazing hotels, but have partnered with some of the best chefs and mixologists on the planet to make your stay truly memorable. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand, they're MCT Co. And they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great-tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor. Head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. So it's funny, we wake up this morning, we hear the the waves crashing, looking at a gorgeous sunrise. How does anyone get work done here in Tulum? <laughs> yeah, we're very, uh, very privileged to to work in the environment that we do. Um, and, and we try very hard not to forget it because um, when you're seeing it every day and working with it every day, it can, um, it can be easy to, to forget just how privileged we are to be in this environment. Yeah, I mean, it's a favorite destination for my wife and I. This is our second time back. And there's just something unique about this area and this land. And we're going to get into into how you came to Tulum. But I want to discuss where you're from originally. I don't think that's a Tulum accent you have. Oh, no, no. No, I'm I'm from New Zealand. Uh, Born and bred New Zealand. What's that like growing up there? Well, New Zealand, it's a little island in the middle of nowhere. Our closest neighbor, Australia, is a 
is a three hour flight away, three and a half hour flight away. Um, so that makes us very, uh, very isolated. Um, so when you're there, you're there. <laughs> um, which is actually why a lot of, a lot of Kiwis uh, go traveling for long periods of time, because when you leave, you want to make the most of it as well. <laughs> um, very much grew up, uh, it's, it's New Zealand is a colony f from England and it kept its pioneering spirit for, 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 for a very long time. So I grew up um, surrounded by uh, a community of people who just, uh, my family and their friends, et cetera, that very much get in and get the job done, get your hands dirty type attitude, right? Um, nothing was ever too difficult. Uh, you just got the job done. <laughs> You mentioned the hard work, and it's so obvious seeing this in, in your hotels, your restaurants here. Did you know you were going to go into the service industry? I knew from a fairly early age um, that I was probably going to end up in the service industry. What about that? How, how did you know from such an early age? Was, was there things you saw around the house, dinner experiences, anything like that? Yeah, look, my, my family, my parents were incredible hosts. They, I grew up surrounded by um, visitors coming over, staying. Um, there was seemed to be always someone extra living in our house or coming for dinner. And both my parents um, took it very seriously with a lot of passion. When they hosted someone or had someone over, they, they went all out. <laughs> and it was all about the details and... Um, God, sometimes my father would even come home with hitchhikers that he had picked up when he had been out on the road and they would stay for a few days and they would just host them and look after them and <laughs> treat them really well. And, you know, the bedroom, the spare bedroom always had, you know, my mum was very particular and it always had the best linen of the house and very crisp and clean and a little vase of roses or flowers or something, <laughs> those little details. And... Um, and she'd make amazing meals as well. But, uh, you know, the, I grew up having to participate in all of this, um, setting the table, making sure the napkins were ironed and pressed and in the right position and the special silver um, silverware would, would come out. And, um, you know, we used to hate it as kids, uh, having to clean the silverware. <laughs> I loved it when they uh, came out with that liquid dip um, cleaner rather than the, the cream that you used to put on them and wait for it to, yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a difficult um, uh, household chore, that one. We, we all as kids hated that one, <laughs> cleaning the silverware. Um, but I guess, yes, I guess that's where my hospitality passion came from. It was in the house. My father would go out when they would have guests to, to stay and, 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 and make sure that there was plenty of ice in the, in the freezer and, and all the glasses were polished. And, and, and they would really take a lot of pride with what they did in, in, in hosting and, and entertaining in the house. So even from that young age, you mentioned the details, and it's something that just kept going through my head this morning as I noticed all of the little details in your property, Mia Moore, and it's those little things that really make all the difference. And so I'm thinking a young Brendan, and did you notice those details and how much impact they had at such a young age, or was it not till later you realized the impact of that? No, it really wasn't till later. It's, it's, it's been in moments of reflection that I've suddenly gone click. That's where it all came from. <laughs> so at the time, no, it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was part of the, the, the household sort of uh, environment and, that we lived in. And um, I had no idea it was going to impact um, what was going to happen in the future. At the time, I had no idea. <laughs> You mentioned the meals and how important they were, and I'm a big believer in the community that's built via meals, and that's why I love staying at your properties, because it's such a special setting for an unbelievable meal. How much, when you're building out a hotel, are you looking at that aspect of the business and creating an unbelievable dining experience? Always, always. For us, um, the restaurant experience, we run boutique hotels, and for me, I think the restaurant experience is, is, is hugely important in that experience. Um, when we opened our 
first property, uh, Mezzanine, in 2004, we actually opened it as a restaurant. It happened to have four rooms um, as part of it as well. But even to this day, I mean, the logo says uh, restaurant, bar, hotel. So restaurant is a big part of who we are. It's a big part of our passion. Um, we, we put a lot of energy into our restaurants and, and we, we want our guests to get excited about the food and beverage programs that we have and to feel um, like they have everything there and, and it's a complete experience for them. The complete experience, I mean, we've lived it, we've, we've seen that, it's, an, it's such an enjoyable experience. I want to know as you transition from a child, I know you've done a great deal of traveling. Where did that itch come to, to explore this world? Uh, look, as I said, as a culture, uh, we Kiwis um, have it in us. It's, it's, it's almost an expected thing that you, at some stage um, in your life, you, you take off and you go on your big OE, um, which is your overseas experience. Um, you know, all my older uh, siblings did it. Um, uh, my friends were doing it. It was just a matter of when not if. <laughs> when are you going to go off and do it? When are you going to go exploring the world and see what's out there? So, um, so I left uh, in my mid-20s. Um, I left my uh, career, in, which had only barely just started, but uh, I studied uh, science, earth sciences, and, and worked as a hydrologist for a, a couple of years. Um, never went back to it in the end. Took off and, and, and I was, yeah, on the road for uh, a good almost two years um, before I uh, finally stopped and, and, uh, and found a place to work, which then al allowed me to continue. <laughs> I'm thinking when, when you're dreaming up this world travel, what was going through your head at first? Where, where did you want to stop? What destinations did you have pinned down? Uh, it was all about adventure. What was going to give me the most adventure? And uh, I think I ended up my first year starting in Vancouver, Canada and doing some uh, some skiing in the middle of the winter there. It was January. And by December, I had made it down to Bolivia. So um, I did most, most of the Americas. I didn't get right down to the south. But um, I think the big draw for me for South America was I think I had studied uh, Machu Picchu as a child in school and that just uh, sparked, that was, that was something that sat with me. I had to go and see it. <laughs> it's so funny how, how things like that from our childhood just resonate so much and you have to explore them. I want to know, were there any other adventures that you just to this day love, you remember that are just ingrained in you still? Oh, yeah. Um, usually... Usually the ones that stick with me, I mean, there's the big sites that you go and see when you're backpacking and, and, and traveling. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Machu Picchu, but there's, you know, Petra and Jordan and, and, and the pyramids and, you know, there's these big sites. Um, but the, the, the experiences that you truly, truly, well, in my experience, the experiences that you really remember and you keep reflecting on are when you go off the beaten track, when you, when you, do something that's sort of a little bit outside of your uh, comfort zone and uh, pushes you a little bit, and and usually those are when that's when the magic starts to happen. When you go, you know, you just take this crazy decision to go somewhere that normally nobody would, <laughs> and you meet people that maybe haven't had a uh, been exposed to a lot of tourism, and and that's when the magic happens. That's that's. Um, those are the special moments that I, that I often go back and reflect on. Can you expand even more about those special moments? Because anyone who's traveled, I think, resonates with this and understands <laughs> there are these, these moments that happen. And I, I would just love to hear even more about your experiences and those special moments for you. You want to hear some of the actual experiences? Sure. I mean, you can see it right now. I'm sitting across from you, the passion <laughs> you're lighting up. I, I can see you even <laughs> thinking about these experiences. I'd love to hear. Um, I did something crazy. I was in the northern part of Peru and, um, you know, most people just head down the coast. I was um, heading down to Lima. For some reason, I met somebody that's triggered a decision to head across the Andes and into the headwaters of the um, Amazon. And it was hardly even mentioned in the Lonely Planet Guide, which, you know, was the Bible in those days. Um, 
so I had to just sort of uh, find out how to do it and, and, uh, and ended up on this boat for a few days heading down the Amazon. We stopped in this little village and uh, we found some, some locals that were prepared to take us in a dugout canoe um, right into the small tributaries of the, of the Amazon. And we went for a few days just camping on the side of the, in the middle of the Amazon, just camping on the side of this little stream and seeing the wildlife and, you know, the anacondas and the crocodiles and things right up close. And, and, <laughs> and you know, this was felt like completely uncharted territory because there were trees that had fallen across the river that we had to, you know, use our axes to cut through and to, so that we could keep going, <laughs> you know, for... Uh, a young, a young uh, traveller in his mid twenties. That was that was pure adventure. That was that was just super fun, and um, you just learn so much um, from the locals and how they live and 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 the experiences. You know the environment that they're in every single day, and you just get to experience it. You know you don't get that living in or staying in in hotels. <laughs> Did you ever say no to an adventure opportunity? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a feeling you might say that. I mean, it, it seems like you yeah. will, you love going after life, which is why this conversation is so fun. <laughs> do, do you have one more experience that, that the Amazon hearing about that is just so fascinating? I'm even thinking about what you view as some of the most gorgeous views on this earth, whether that be an amazing sunrise, sunset, something like that. The thing when you're uh, when you're traveling and you're with like-minded people and you sort of you know you usually end up with some travel buddies that you've met along the way. We had this uh, experience in in the um, deserts of of uh, Jordan where we uh, we had a local um, take us out to camp in the um, in Wadi Rum. We wanted to uh, we want to experience the Lawrence of Arabia sort of uh, experience. We wanted to get right out there. And we, uh, we camped overnight out in the desert. And for some reason, the next morning, we, we took a decision. And reflecting, it was probably a stupid decision. But we, we, we asked the guy how long it would take to hike through the desert to get across to Egypt. And he said, well, you can do it in a day. Um, so off we, off we went. There were four of us with two guitars and a didgeridoo. And, um, and we hiked across with this really quite uh, inadequate map that we had that, that was kind of like from a tourist guide or something that we'd picked up and, you know, completely inadequate. And so the day went on and on and we kept hiking and, you know, we, we stopped for lunch and then we stopped for afternoon, you know, refreshments and soon we were out of food and water and, um, and it was, the sun was starting to go down and, and uh, we, we saw, we were all hunched over the map in the middle of the desert going, you know, we, we are actually seem to be lost. <laughs> so we all decided that we needed to head up to this ridge and we were sure that at the top of that ridge um, we were going to look down the other side and it was going to be the main highway. We were sure, right? So an hour later we get up there and unfortunately it was like we just looked down into what was like the chasm of doom. It was like black clouds were forming. It was, it was getting ready to rain. And I mean, it never rains in the, in the desert in the Middle East. So um, fortunately, um, we had passed a Bedouin tent um, about, uh, about 30 minutes prior. And so we'd waved to them as we'd gone by and thinking back, they must have just been thinking, Who, what is going on here? Where are these guys going to? <laughs> So we get back and um, we go to visit them and they were incredibly, it was almost like they were waiting for us. You know, they, 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 they knew we were coming back. <laughs> there was, looked like there was extra food on the, on the, on the, on the fire, um, you know, the goat stew. So they took us in and fed us and um, we, uh, we stayed the night with them. They, uh, we were allowed to stay in the goat's tent <laughs> with them. We weren't allowed to be in the main uh, sleeping quarters with them and their, with the family, but uh, we were very, very happy to be in with the goats. And um, and the next uh, the next morning, uh, there was a trader, uh, I think, coming to check out the goats and 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 buy some of their goats. And 
and he uh, kindly drove us where we were wanting to go the next morning. Were you guys even headed somewhat in the right direction? Uh, not really. <laughs> not really. So those are the sort of uh, moments that you think, mm, maybe that was not such a good idea. I'm getting butterflies. You telling this story, thinking about the fear. Were, were you guys in absolute terror when you got to the top of that peak and look out and see that you're nowhere where you thought you were? I don't know. I guess we were um, young and stupid and and we didn't really think about the consequences as much as we should have. <laughs> so we never had a, a strong sense of panic or fear, no. Is there anywhere on this planet you haven't been yet but, but are really hoping to experience? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I, I still have South Africa on my list of, of, of destinations I would love to go to, as, as well as uh, Indonesia. Those are two, two uh, bucket list yeah. destinations that two I haven't made list. it to. Yeah. Well, so how did you end up in Tulum here? Actually, that's um, the first time. Uh, it's, this is uh, an interesting story as well. On my journey th from, from that started in Canada and ended in Bolivia, I, I flew into Cancun from, from Miami. I had almost zero Spanish, and I knew that I needed to learn some Spanish. So I had heard that Guatemala was a good place to do that. And I had heard that uh, Belize has English as their, as their um, main language. Um, so I thought, great, Cancun, Belize, Guatemala. <laughs> Learn some Spanish and then I'll be set. Um, so I got picked up at the Cancun airport. I really had no plan, no plan at all. That's how I generally traveled back in those days. Um, and I, a guy picked me up and kindly uh, taxied me to the uh, Cancun bus terminal and on the way, I, he had been asking me what my plans were. And I said, well, look, I'm really not really sure. I'm going to look for a hostel or something. And he said, no, no, look, you need to go to, uh, you need to, go to a place called Tulum. And uh, so he dropped me at the bus term and he said, just go in there and buy a ticket to Tulum. Just say to them, boy, at Tulum, which means I'm going to Tulum. So that was in 96. And I went to Tulum, and I had no idea at that stage that it was going to become my home in the future. The bus pulls up to Tulum. What's first going through your mind? Uh, well, it was my first experience um, in a truly humid, uh, tropical destination. <laughs> Very different from the winter in Canada. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I was just like, wow. It, you can the the smell and the humidity and the and the um, the whole experience was just so foreign and so exciting to me. And the first time I saw those Tulum ruins perched up uh, above the sea like that, and the and the and the gorgeous color of the Caribbean and the white sand beaches, and I was just like, wow, this is paradise. And 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 it was also the very first time that I swam in the sea where it was like the temperature of a bath. <laughs> In New Zealand, you know, growing up in New Zealand where it's sort of semi-Arctic temperatures, the, 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 the sea there, and, you know, you brave it as a kid and you jump in and you, you know, <laughs> yeah, but it really isn't pleasant. Um, this was like another world. It was, yeah. And so that you mentioned that's the first time. How long were you in Tulum at that time? Um, I spent about a week okay. uh, living on the beach. I had actually, I was camping in a tent. <laughs> Just down on the same beach that we that mezzanine our property mezzanine overlooks actually um, had no idea what was gonna what the future was going to hold um, and then you know met some uh, fellow travelers that were heading down to Belize and my plan continued. <laughs> Did you ever think you were gonna come back to Tulum and this would be such a big part of your life? Uh, I actually came back twice. Um, uh, in my backpacking days and traveling days with different groups of people because I just loved it so much. And it was like one of those places, we've been on the road now, let's go and chill in Tulum. That was, you know, that was, that was the place to go and chill. So then what was the, the final moment where you ended up here full time? How did that transpire? Well, I, um, I was living in Sydney at the time and I was actually on my way back after a, around eight years that I'd been away from New Zealand. I'd been back to visit a, a few times, but um, I was living in Sydney and I was really, 
I was, I was laboring at the time doing some, some, I was helping a guy build his house. And I was just contemplating, what was I going to do next? Am I going to go back to my hydrology career? Am I, what am I going to do? You know, it was one of those moments, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the, I've been on the road a lot and, and working in, in Ibiza and on the ski, uh, in the ski resorts of Colorado, et cetera. I was, I was sort of ready to, it was time to think about what, what was my long-term career going to be. And, um, and it was while I was in Sydney that my brother-in-law, uh, John, he, he called me and said, um, hey, I've just bought some property in Tulum. Do you, do you know it? And I said, yes, I know it. <laughs> and he said, well, how about, you know, you come and do something with me and, um, and we, we do a little hotel or something. And I said, well, I'll be on the next plane. <laughs> there was no question in your mind? Oh, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. <laughs> It was like a dream, you know, to, to, to go to Tulum and to, uh, to open a hotel um, with my brother-in-law. So did you guys actually have much of a plan about where the property was going to be, what the, the hotel was going to look like, or was it more, I think this is something we could do? Uh, it was more very spontaneous and, um, and uh, it was just a series of events that led us to um, build what we did with Mezzanine, the first property. Um, and uh, the concept that we created, et cetera, et cetera. We did a Thai restaurant, which looking back was probably the most crazy thing to do, you know, coming to Mexico to set up a Thai restaurant. But um, <laughs> in, in 2004, 2003, I'd been living in Sydney and I'd, previous to that I'd just done a big trip through Thailand and uh, I just fell in love with the cuisine, the, the food, the Thai food. And, um, and living in Sydney at that time, it was just like it was the hot, cuisine. I mean, every second restaurant that was opening was Thai. So I thought, right, let's do it. And I thought, you know, the climates are, uh, are similar, tropical, and I'm surely we can grow um, what we need to <laughs> for the ingredients that are missing. I'm sure we can grow them. And that's exactly what we did. <laughs> Speaking of food, do you have a most memorable meal or dining experience throughout all your travel? Oh, that's a really difficult question. Um, there's been so, so much variety. I think something, what does, what jumps out at me? I think probably uh, dining in the deserts of Morocco and, 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 the, and the Moroccan food and having this banquet. Um, that was, that was one of the meals that I, when you ask me that question, that jumps to mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to see what your response was since you've been all over the place. <laughs> I want to jump back into you coming here and opening this hotel. And it, it appears like this must have been a, a huge risk. Did you view it at all as a risk? Um, personally, no, because I was not financing it. <laughs> my that, brother, that always helps, yes. <laughs> my brother-in-law was the one. He was the owner. He was financing it. So for me, it was more of an adventure and, and an opportunity to, to get stuck in and, and, and apply many things that I had learned and, you know, I had a lot of freedom to create the concept and, and uh, create what Mezzanine still is today. Opportunities, challenges, what's it like opening up a hotel on the other side of the world? I, I just need to know when you first started out, what are some of those big challenges? Adjusting to the culture in any country when you're actually taking a decision to live there and to actually try and be productive and, and, and get a business underway uh, was by far the, the biggest challenge. Um, we arrived in a tiny little town. Tulum's a different place to what it was then um, in 2004. Uh, it's, it's growing a lot and a lot more is available now. Um, back then, uh, just, prov just finding what we needed to run a business at the level that we wanted to run it um, was difficult. Um, adjusting to the cultural differences, of course, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a completely different culture here in Mexico and it's a wonderful culture, but it's, 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 it, it took a lot of adjusting to, you know, a lot of, a lot of moments where you're going, I don't get this, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> because all your programming from all your life, you know, changes, has to change. You have to reprogram, put another chip in. <laughs> So I'm interested about reprogramming and, and being the CEO. What type of core values or, or principles have you instilled to, to run such a successful group now? Um, we're in the hospitality industry. We, 
we are the we're in the experiences business. We're dealing with people every single day, and you have to have a passion for what you're doing. You have to have a passion for what you're doing. It's 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 not an easy industry, um, and there's a certain type of person that gets absolute pleasure from providing an amazing experience to guests, right? So we, as our business and as our company and as our group has grown, we've just had to keep seeking, finding the right people to join our group, to join our family, um, who share that passion for serving others basically is what it is and getting pleasure from it. How do you find those people? Uh, I'm thinking about our waiter this morning at breakfast, Alberto, who we had a number of years ago uh, when we first visited here. And you you can see it. He truly cares about how everything tastes for you, how your experience is. How do you find those people? We... uh... We interview them, we ask them questions, we dig in. We dig in because it, it doesn't take long before the true core soul of a person, you know, comes out. And we're looking for kindness. We're looking for those people that truly, truly, um, you know, have that passion for service. And that is one of our core values, by the way, passion, yeah. passion for service. I mean, it's you, you can see it across all your hotels, your restaurants. I'm also thinking about top talent and the dinner menu by Paul Bentley, which is a world-class chef that you guys have, have partnered with. How do you find talent like that? How, how do you envision someone like that creating a menu for your restaurant? Well, um, look, we learned fairly quickly that, you know, we're not, none of us in our group, um, well, in our core family, you know, the, the, the founders and, and um, none of us are chefs. We're not trained chefs. And we had a vision of what we were wanting to um, provide and, and, and what we wanted to do. But the basic reality is you have to find chefs to, to join you on that journey. And we just uh, were very lucky to be introduced to Paul at the right time. Um, he, um, he had fairly recently uh, come to Tulum to do some consulting for another um, business and um, and uh, we, we uh, hired him to do some consulting for us as well and just improve our menus and, and um, just work on, on the details. And uh, the partnership that we have now um, just works really, really well. It's, um, uh, Paul's from Australia. He's from Perth. And uh, we, we, we come from a similar culture. So we just get on really well. Um, and there's just no, no issues. Any, any, any time I can pick up the phone and talk to Paul and just, you know, any complaint or any, anything that I see that we need to change or improve, he's, he's just completely open and, you know, um, certainly not one of the, 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 the chefs that has the big egos, et cetera. He's very down to earth and, 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 and he's like, we are, we just want to provide the best we can for our guests. And that's, that's, that's why it's a pleasure to work with someone like Paul. Providing that for the guests, you mentioned times you need changes, fixes. How often are you shifting how you guys do things? Well, um, whenever we see the need, uh, you've got to stay fresh. But then there's there's times when there's a dish that just works. It becomes a, a classic. I think I think you know one of them that you yeah you fell in love with right a few years ago. Yes, and luckily we had this last night, and then we were fortunate enough in the room we're staying in. Uh, there's a, a book of, of a menu book, and so we found it on on the page. So I obviously snapped the recipe. You've got the recipe, recipe yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of course there's certain things that work, and you just want to keep it there. Um, and and then there's always a little bit of uh, creativity and rotation and trying new things as well. You've got to keep it fresh as well. So it's a balance between the two. Yeah, that balance is, is one, I'm sure. It's constantly evolving. You guys are trying to figure out. In that core group, when you guys are, are discussing plans, what does that look like? Do you have a, a big whiteboard like we're sitting next to here where you guys are mapping out this is what we might want to try? How does that look for you guys? Uh, look, no, look, um, we... Uh, generally just sit down at a table and, and just have a conversation. And I'll, 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 if we're talking about Paul Bentley, we'll just, you know, share with him what direction we feel it would be good. But 
we largely rely on his experience as well and what he likes to create, right? That's that's the that's the point. We don't want to take him off his journey and his his what what he likes. Yeah, you bring in the top talent for that reason exactly. Each of the hotels, the restaurants has a, a different feel, a different vibe. How strategic is that when you guys are opening them? Do you, do you want them to have a, a completely different feel? Yes, we do. Yes, absolutely we do. Um, we're in the boutique hotel um, industry, and I think for me, boutique hotel is all about um, being individual and being creative and just sort of being outside of of the typical traditional hotel concept, which is, you know, um, a little bit cookie cutter for the, when you're talking about the the, the large hotel brands. Um, for us, it's really important to to have different uh, feel and, and concept and and aesthetic at each of our properties. Um, it's something that evolved it just happened um we've got a different story behind each of our properties um and that story or that series of events or that um location itself uh dictated uh which style style or concept of hotel um we were going to create on that location even in tulum our four properties here Every location is very, very different from the other. Um, so it needed to be a different type of hotel on each different location. Um, and no, there's no master plan. A lot of it just happens. It just evolves. We get together and we talk about, you know, what sort of feel does this property give us and, and what, you know, what, what does that lead to with, with creating a the building and creating the hotel concept. I'm thinking about your childhood and the details, and I'd be curious to know what little details across some of your properties that you guys do are some of your favorites. Well, we try to host our guests in a way that truly shows that we care. We want them to be in our house. We want them to feel like they are in our in our house. Um, so I don't know the 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 coffee delivered in a thermos to your door in the morning, you know, so you don't even have to make it yourself in room or you don't need to go across to the, to the restaurant. If it's for the sunrise where the restaurant's not even open yet, you've got a, a thermos of hot coffee sitting at your door of your hotel room. Um, and equally, at the end of the day, uh, when you get back to your room, there's a little thermos of hot tea waiting for you with, 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 with a, um, a little turndown service, um, chocolate, etc. Those little details are about trying to make people, our guests, feel like they are being looked after and cared for at one of their friend's houses or in someone's house. Is that the key experience, the key feeling you want guests walking away with, that they just spent a few days at a friend's house? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, it gives us so much pleasure when we might read reviews or hear directly from our guests that that is the experience that they have had and, and that they leave with. And that just makes it all worthwhile when you hear that feedback. I can imagine so. I'm, I'm thinking here it is. It's 2019, TripAdvisor, social media. How do you guys as a small boutique hotel stay on top of things like that? We just don't get caught up in the hype of it all. Um, at the end of the day, if we're delivering the experience that we want to deliver for our guests, and we don't get it right every time, of course, when you're dealing with, with people, you know, every person has a different personality and with, within that personality there's, there's, there's a whole series of moods <laughs> that change either by the hour or by the minute sometimes. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's challenging to, to get it right every time. Sometimes people just want to be left alone and not talk to anyone and, and other times they want full engagement and, and want to hear stories and, and, and that's, that's the key to really being on the top of our game is to be able to 
see, read, and anticipate the needs of our guests. Um, running small boutique hotels gives us that opportunity to do that, and that's I think we're very privileged to be able to do that. You can't get that level of service in a sort of 100-plus room hotel. You, you just cannot. Uh, I mean, as much as they would many companies would like to, um, you just cannot see and, and, and have that intimate relationship with each guest. Um, whereas we try to. We, we do our best to. We don't get it right every time, as I said, but we try. You said anticipate, and I'm thinking when you first started, you must have known nothing about opening a hotel. So in terms of, of learning more, understanding more, how comfortable are you now? Does it, does it feel much more natural for you as opposed to when you just started? Well, after the number of years that I've been sort of involved in this industry now, um, certainly I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. There's no doubt about it. And, um, but even when we first opened, um, I just went back to what I learned as a kid, you know, and that's just good old-fashioned home hospitality and, and looking after the guest. I'm thinking of a, a young entrepreneur, maybe just starting a business, running a business. What do you want to instill upon them? What, what's key? I know you hit on a few things. Anything else you think is really important for leading a business, a successful one at that? Um, yes. I, I think it's really important to always have a plan. Um, have a plan, even if it's just a basic plan, but have a plan. Um, I think it's really important to, to always be honest uh, with yourself um, and, of course, with be, honesty is, is, is important across the board, but analysing data is, I think is very, very important for a business. Sometimes that helps you um, navigate your way through uh, tricky decisions that you have to take, so let, let the data show you and... and um, and that that's, comes back to that being honest with yourself. You might have this passionate sort of vision, but if you have to honestly look at the data and it tells you that you should not be pursuing that any further, you've got to, you've got to listen. You've got to see that and listen. Know your market, of course. Um, your com competitors, really important. See what's going on around you. Um, don't be left behind. Um, and be flexible to change. I think that's really important. You might have a plan, but you've got to remain flexible to, to, to adapt and change if you need to. I think uh, it's a good idea to avoid partnerships if you can. Um, and if you cannot avoid having a partnership, then, then, then get it very clear the, what the agreement is and, and even, even an exit plan um, well and truly um, mapped out. Uh, I think that's important. Those are some profound principles, and obviously you have a ton of experience, which I'm sure has has led to those. I'm also thinking about, you mentioned, just understanding your your competition, who else is out there. How often do you attend another restaurant, and when you do, maybe not even necessarily a competitor's restaurant, but what, what are you looking for when you enter a new environment? I um, am one of those unfortunate people that if I dine in, an, in a restaurant, I, it's very hard for me to relax, <laughs> whether it's ours or whether it's someone else's. Because I, I am, was hoping you'd respond this way. <laughs> because I'm constantly looking at every single detail and uh, my family go crazy. <laughs> I, I think it's really important to um, get out there and see what, what others are doing. Um, I have a, a young family at home now. I'm not able to do it as much as I used to, but I have, you know, people on my team that are, that are always going out and, and, and checking out the scene and, 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 and letting me know what's going on when, when I can't do it um, with a new uh, seven-month-old baby in the house at the moment. So I'm always looking, you know, the operation. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm not timing how long it takes for the drink to go from order to the bar and back to my table. <laughs> in our restaurants, yes, but <laughs> it won't be quite that extreme in other people's restaurants. But, I, but, I, but I'm looking at all those details and I'm just seeing what, you know, at what level of service are they? Um, because, you know, we're always trying to be better. Um, we always set the bar very high for ourselves and 
I, it's, it's always difficult to get there. Uh, it takes a lot of work to, to, to get a team to be working at that level that we, would, that we want. You mentioned that team, and we're fortunate enough to be in your, your recently new beautiful offices here. There's a, a big group of people outside. How many people are currently part of this team? Uh, here in Tulum right now, our, our, our entire operation is around 350. Quite a lot of people to, uh, <laughs> to get to be productive and work. What is that like, managing a group that big? Um, not easy, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the further I get away uh, that I'm removed from, from, from the operation itself, um, of course, the harder it is to, to, to get all of those philosophies and practices, best practices instilled um, deeply rooted into the entire company. Um, so that takes a lot of uh, energy uh, on a daily basis. Um, of course, we have systems and we have training programs and we have, you know, uh, procedures in place. Um, but it's, 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 it's amazing how quickly, if you sort of turn your back for, for, for a short period of time, how quickly things can change. So, um, I have a great team. We're a great team. I have, I have, have, uh, great GMs in place at the, at, at each hotel and, and their um, support team as well, their heads of departments, um, and uh, our corporate office as well. Everyone comes into work full of uh, enthusiasm and passion every day, and you know that's what it's all about. That's why I wanted to have you on because I knew whoever was running this, the experience we had at, at multiple restaurants and, and hotels, I, I was interested and intrigued by that. I understand you're doing a great job, but I really truly got to live that. So I appreciate what you've instilled with this group. And I, I want the listener who, who's hearing about Tulum and interested in coming down here, anything else they should know uh, about the hotels or just the area in general? Um, look, Tulum is a, is a magical place. Um, it's, 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 it's got so much to offer. It really does. Um, it has something for everybody. It really, really does. Um, uh, it's not just about the beaches. Um, there's the, 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 the Mayan history, the pyramids, the archaeological sites, there's the jungle, there's these amazing cenote system where you can go for refreshing freshwater swims in the middle of the jungle or even in caves and, um, it's, it's one of the uh, biggest destinations in the world for cave diving itself. Um, there's adventure parks uh, just up the road, um, uh, rappel lines. You know, there's just something for the kids. There's something for the honeymooners. There's something for everybody. Um, and I think that is reflected also in our, in our hotels. You know, we have adults-only hotels. We've got the more romantic ones. We've got the more family-oriented ones at, Lize you know, at La Zebra and Pez. Each of our properties presents a different experience and a different feel. So um, we know that we've got the property for, for whoever is looking for a different experience. We've, we've probably got something there for you, unless you're looking for the all-inclusive um, thousand-bedroom hotel experience. We don't do that. <laughs> you, you certainly don't, but you have truly encapsulated that feel. And the reason we came back is because when we left, it was like we stayed with friends. So I think you guys do an excellent job at that. For someone listening to this, anywhere they should be checking out to, to stay in the loop on your hotels, anything like that? Uh, ColibriBatookHotels.com is our, um, our centralized website. And then each of our hotels has their own website as well. Um, you can follow us on Instagram uh, with each of our hotels, Mezzanine, Mi Amor, Alpez, and La Cebra, and Yamaya, which is uh, not in Tulum. It's um, on a stunning little island just off the uh, Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. Um, absolutely uh, one of my, actually my favorite property that we have in our, our, of the five. And stay tuned. We've got another property um, in the pipeline. It's, it's exciting uh, what's, what we're planning. So. Um, can't say too much more at the stage, but uh, yeah, there's another one on the way. Well, we're going to have all that linked up in the show notes. But once again, Brendan, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you, Sean. Hey, guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. 
you need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options, and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. Looking for your next getaway to a beach paradise? Ever consider Tulum, Mexico, which is one of my favorite places to spend a few days? Then look no further than Colibri Boutique Hotels to make your trip to paradise one you'll never forget. Head to ColibriBoutiqueHotels.com to see their hotels, all of which offer their own unique feel. Calibri not only has built amazing hotels, but have partnered with some of the best chefs and mixologists on the planet to make your stay truly memorable. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand, they're MCT Co. And they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh. What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? Thanks for listening to another episode of What Got You There. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and also share with your friends. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you next time. If you want to stay up to date on all things I'm working on behind the scenes and everything we've got going on at What Got You There, head over to whatgotyouthere.com. You'll also be able to see more on podcast guests and what they're doing. Thanks to Justin Great for providing us the intro and outro song. If you like his music and want to find out more about what he's working on, head over to justingreat.com.